captures the essence of what's going on in planetary interiors. And um, this is what we needed to understand. There's um, a great deal of unknowns about this process. This is Earth. And um, essentially, the, uh, the temperature difference between the core mantle boundary in the Earth and the surface drives heat flow. But the temperature gradient, the radial gradient, is so small that heat flow happens only at the core mantle boundary and the surface. Heat flow is carried by convection, as you are seeing here in this movie. Um, but uh, this convection process is very, very slow. It's subsolidus convection. Um, and uh, near the surface, there is incongruent melting that spills magma through the surface, that uh, through these fissures at the surface, at boundary between plates, that solidifies and produces the Earth crust, the oceanic crust, which has different chemical composition than the Earth's interior. So a great deal of questions related with the composition of the deep Earth, uh, where we don't have samples for, uh, for um, it's, it's at stake right now. This is one of the biggest problems in the last 30, 50 years. Um, and uh, so these are, this is what we are trying to understand. Uh, temperature gradients throughout the mantle is, you know, it's uh, at most half a Kelvin per kilometer. And uh, the, the flow, the subsolid flow is of the order of a couple of centimeters per year on the surface, even slower in the deep mantle. So this is what we are trying to understand. The materials are polycrystalline aggregate, um, silicates, oxides containing iron, which is strongly correlated. And that's the whole point of, um, of my presentation today. What happens in the deep earth with iron in the silicates and oxides. So um, we don't have samples for the deep earth beyond 600 kilometers. We don't have direct samples. Uh, most of what we know, from the, we know from that region comes from seismology and seismic tomography. Earthquakes happen um, and uh, generate uh, longitudinal compressional and shear waves that propagate throughout the interior. These are the body waves. And seismologists perform seismic tomography, a highly computational field in geophysics. Um, and with that, they extract um, the uh, velocities, a three-dimensional velocity fields uh, throughout the Earth. And that's where we get most of information of the materials properties. So the compressional velocity, here it is, depends on the book modules and the shear modules and density. The shear, the shear velocity depends on the shear modules and density. And then we have this um, book, um, uh, book, um, uh, book velocity. Let me move my, um, um, uh, the book velocity, which is not linearly independent, depends on the other two. And uh, in first order, uh, it's assumed that uh, the material at each point is isotropic and the polycrystalline um, aggregates. Um, and if we want to understand the properties of the aggregate, we usually use voigt royce Hill average bounds for the properties of the aggregate, knowing the properties of each in individual phase. So this is essentially how the, uh, uh, we investigate uh, the velocities in the uh, Earth's interior. This is, so this is what we have to compute to try to interpret what seismologists see. So in, in 1981, um, uh, analysis of the seismic record produced these one dimensional velocity models for the Earth, um, basic information about the Earth's interior. And these are spherical averages of the velocities. Uh, as you can see, there are discontinuities in compressional waves, in shear waves, and in the density, which are caused by uh, phase transition in some of the minerals in the aggregates. Um, and they define the boundaries of these layers in the, in, in the Earth's mantle and the Earth's core. Uh, here at 29 kilometers, 2900 kilometers depth, we have the core mantle boundary. You see huge discontinuities in velocities. Um, uh, the, the, the mantle, the rocky shell above the core is silicates and oxides and these discontinuities here that you see at about around 460 
kilometers, they are caused by phase transitions in the silicates. And, uh, and uh, in the core, the outer core is liquid. You see that the shear wave disappears in this outer core region and then reappears in the inner core region, which is, um, which is solid iron. This is iron core iron with some light elements. Uh, we are still trying to figure out how much of each light element could be there because this is the density of the core is different from the density of iron, molten iron and solid iron. But the silicate mantle um, is the region that I study. We have samples up to 660 approximately, uh, at 410 for sure, but uh, diamond samples with inclusions coming from the six, up to 660, but these are not representative samples of the lower mantle, this region between 660 and 2900 kilometers depth. And this is the region that needs um, a lot of ab initio calculations uh, uh, to, to be understood. Experiments are very challenging. Temperatures in this region, as you see next, uh, uh, are very high and pressures also. But this is the region that I will be addressing today, the lower mantle of the Earth. Uh, this, uh, uh, so, um, and um, so the one dimensional model I showed you um, is the spherical average. Uh, uh, but today, to seismic tomography produces a lot more information three-dimensional uh, velocity maps. For example, this is a shear velocity map showing uh, variations with respect to the spherical model of plus or minus 1.5%. Not very large variations, but very revealing uh, variations about the structure and processes that are happening in the deep Earth. Fast regions are blue. Um, and uh, as low regions are red, uh, this is in first order, this is related with temperatures. This blue region is a, is a, is a plate, a plate, a plate that is subducting into the deep mantle. And these red regions uh, are associated with plumes that are coming to the surface, but are not, not necessarily plumes, but they are associated with plumes. So they must be warmer, but the composition of these regions are still being debate, high, hotly debated these days. So ab initial calculations try to calculate velocities and try to interpret uh, these observations. This is one area of application of ab initial calculations. The other area is geodynamics, where we compute uh, properties such as density book models, thermal expansion coefficient, specific heat, thermal conductivity, and offers to uh, geodynamicists to simulate convection in the Earth. And this is thermochemical convection with materials of diff with different properties, different uh, thermodynamic properties, that they try to simulate um, this, this, this flow and see if they produce structures as seen by uh, seismologists. So, um, Geodynamicists also use these properties calculated by first principles. The only property we don't really calculate is the viscosity, subsolidus viscosity. This is a very difficult property to calculate and it's only modeled. Um, uh, but the other properties we calculate it and offer to geodynamicists as well. So today, um, there is a, a, a very a become very integrated field of geodynamics, seismology, mineral physics, all computational, that is modern geophysics. Um, uh, uh, so uh, mineral physics, we call uh, ab initio and experimental mineral physics, uh, offering these essential properties to under, to, for geodynamic simulations and for seismologists to try to interpret um, seismic tomography. We work, I work together. I, I collaborate with seismologists directly now and uh, with geodynamics, geodynamicists occasionally when I have uh, some form of advanced event. Oops, 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 oops. Um, uh, that I can uh, uh, provide, new information I can provide to them. So um, regarding the lower mantle, uh, now I'm going, today I'm going to discuss um, uh, spin crossovers in iron in the lower mantle phases. The spin crossovers, um, it's, a, it's a 
purely quantum phenomenon. And um, it happens in iron at pressures and temperatures of the lower mantle. The temperatures in this region here from 660 kilometers depth to 2,900 kilometers depth is 23 gigapascals to 136 gigapascal. Uh, 136 gigapascals is 1.36 megabar, uh, millions of atmospheres or millions of atmospheres. And the temperature is from two to 4,000 Kelvin. Um, so the phases of the lower mantle um, that undergo uh, spin state change in iron are these two. These are the major phases of the lower mantle. Um, they, uh, oops, oh, what's going on here? I don't know. Um, the, it's magnesium silicate perovskite, which is not um, a pure MgSiO3 perovskite. Uh, it has, it's alloyed with iron and uh, aluminum. It has um, ferrous iron, mostly ferrous iron, iron two plus, replacing magnesium, substituting magnesium. It has also some iron two plus, in, in which a couple of substitution in the magnesium and silicon side um, uh, produce uh, ferric iron, iron three plus. There is also some aluminum in the silicon side, uh, and uh, and uh, magnesium. Iron oxide, it's called ferropericlase, is rock salt, it's MGO in the rock salt structure with some iron replaced magnesium. Um, in average, mag uh, the, the composition of the lower mantle has approximately 10% iron replacing magnesium, essentially. But the, the, the rock salt phase takes more iron than the, 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 the perovskite phase. So perovskite is more complicated because it has, has ferrospheric iron, two sites for replacement of iron and together with aluminum. And we have addressed these complexities in the calculation of seismic velocities. These other phases post perovskite exist very deep down in the mantle and uh, way beyond the, 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 the pressures and temperatures in which the uh, spin state change happens in iron. So as you see throughout this talk, there are several aspects of materials theory and simulations that come together to be able to address uh, this problem. So in 2003 and 2004, the spin state change in ferropericlase, the rock salt phase, and the following year um, in the perovskite phase were discovered, uh, detected experimentally and uh, several uh, speculations about their implications for geophysics uh, were proposed at that time, which we we're still trying to um, unravel. Um, so the, the, the major, uh, so no question there was a spin state change, but the, 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 specula the speculations about geophysical implications are still being unraveled. So uh, in my talk, I will tell you about the spin crossover or spin transition in iron in these phases. And I will show you the thermodynamic model for spin crossover, which is mostly a been issue, but there is also some uh, analytical modeling um, in ferropericlase. And then I'll show you that uh, the spin crossover in iron in perovskite is not quite what it seems. And then I'll show you very briefly the spin crossover in ferric iron and, uh, and in aluminum bearing perovskite. I will show you the manifestation of the crossover in the mantle and, uh, and uh, the geophysical implications that we have unraveled. So the techniques we use for simulations is DFT plus U, which I started studying very early, even before the method was published. And, uh, and it was quite successful. Uh, today, the, the, the DFT plus U is done self-consistently and structurally consistent, and we do phonons with DFT plus U. We use the quantum espresso. We use the quasi-harmonic approximation to compute vibration of free energy, and uh, we use the <clears throat> V2K all-electron uh, code um, to compute Mosbauer quadrupole splitting, which is very uh, important for understanding the spin crossover. So this is the spin crossover. What is going on? For example, if we have <clears throat> uh, fer ferrous iron in, um, in octahedron site, like in, in, in ferropericlase, the rock salt structure, we have iron two, two plus, 
and uh, 3D6 um, electronic configuration. In octahedral field, we know that um, D electrons is split into a triplet, T2G electrons, uh, uh, orbitals, and a doublet of uh, EG orbitals. The T2G point away from neighboring oxygens and EG point toward the, the neighboring oxygens that are negatively charged. So this, this is the crystal field splitting you are seeing here. And if we have six electrons, we fill the orbitals with spin up and then the orbitals with spin down, it has uh, the spin down elect orbital has higher energy. If you calculate the density of states in, in, in um, a spin polarized calculation, you see exactly what I'm showing you here. Uh, the, the splitting between the up and down orbitals is called exchange splitting, Ohm's rule energy splitting. And um, so if you fill these orbitals at low pressures, this is the approximately the electronic configuration and you have total spin S equal to five up and one down. With increasing pressure, oxygens get closer to iron, the crystal field split, splitting increases, the, the Ohm's rule energy splitting does not increase, does not change very much. So you end up with the possibility of the spin down electrons, T2G below the EG we spin up and the, the electrons start moving into the spin down electrons. Um, and uh, it, this is a typical configuration with four up and two down that would produce the S equal one state, the intermediate spin state. At highest pressures, you have this configuration. The, spleen, uh, the crystal field splitting is so large that uh, only the T2G orbitals are filled and this is the low spin state with S equals zero. The intermediate spin state, as I'm going to show, has very high energy and this configuration is not um, likely to exist at all. I'm going to show you uh, the relative energy of these configurations. But so the transition that is observed experimentally is from the high spin to low spin, HS to LS, S equal two to S equal zero in ferrous iron. In uh, with iron three, three plus, there is a similar um, transition uh, with different spin states, but um, that's how it goes. So this is ferropericlase, um, the rock salt structure with iron replacing magnesium. Uh, in uh, the concentration of iron, this is structure that we expect in the lower mantle. In most of the lower mantle is approximately 18 uh, to 20 percent iron. So the charge density in this structure uh, in iron, the, the high spin state is spherical uh, because all the orbitals are occupied. And then you have the spin down electron entering in one, occupying one of the T2G states. It could, there are three possibilities here. Uh, we have to be aware of that. And if you replace magnesium by one of these uh, high spin iron, you have uh, an extent, uh, uh, a deformation of this octahedral, a young teller deformation of this kind. In the low spin state, only the T2G orbitals are occupied with cubic symmetry and uh, replacing magnesium by a low spin iron. Uh, contracts the octahedron by approximately uniformly, approximately this way. In going from high spin to low spin, the octahedron, uh, the iron octahedron collapses by 8%. This is a huge change in volume that even if you have only 20% iron in this structure, uh, changes the density of ferropericlase significantly that would produce uh, changes in, in density and elastic properties and therefore, therefore uh, seismic velocities. This is very important. This is a type of, uh, of phase change that seismologists, uh, the geophysicists are not familiar with. And by the way, when we started not even materials physicists, we're very familiar with this process and, and the, the consequences of this process and temperature pressure dependence of this spin state change. So here, for example, is a, uh, is a static calculation, ab initio calculation, the FT plus U, early ab initio, the FT plus U, it was not self-consistent at that time, 2006. This is the difference in enthalpy between the high spin state and the low spin state for 3D. It is, is a supercell uh, with 64 atoms, and then we replace one um, 
one, four, and six uh, magnesium at uh, ions by uh, iron. And uh, it, it, they are ordered configuration, so it's not too fancy, uh, but it, it was challenging uh, to do this calculation. And therefore, uh, here you see the enthalpy crossing at about uh, um, uh, uh, around uh, 30, 35 um, uh, GPA. And, um, and, and within the accuracy we had at that time, we could not distinguish a, 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 a concentration dependence of this spin state change of the spin transition. That meant that there isn't much interaction between irons in this uh, uh, spatial configuration of irons, uniform distribution of irons. So this inspired, so if there is not much interaction between irons, uh, we could uh, ad address um, the thermodynamics of this solid uh, of the solid solution using an ideal solid solution model, but not an ideal solid solution model of uh, of uh, M MGO and FEO. It's an ideal solid solution model of two end members: a high spin ferropericlase and a low spin ferropericlase, which I will discuss much more next. So what you see here is the compression, blue is the compression curve of the high spin ferropericlase with 18.75% iron. Red is the compression curve of this low spin ferropericlase, all irons in the low spin state. The crosses is experimental data on 17% iron, and you see that this superposes, uh, first it, uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, it it agrees with the high spin state and then at higher pressures with the low spin state, but there is a broad region where it crosses over from the high spin compression curve to the low spin compression curve. And uh, it, it suggests that in this broad pressure range, we would have a mixed spin region. The, the green and orange correspond to one third, one third low spin and two thirds low spin res respectively. So we define this N as the low spin fraction in the solid solution. So to understand the, this process, we set up an ideal solid solution where we had uh, some fraction of uh, ferropericlase in the high spin state and some fraction of ferropericlase in the low spin state. There is a considerable volume of ch volume change throughout this spin state change. And even at, at 300 Kelvin, uh, it's quite broad pressure range from uh, uh, here about um, um, around 40 to 60 uh, gigapascals. This is different from a first order transition. This is not even a second order transition. There is no symmetry change here. This is cross a crossover. So this is the thermodynamics of the, the solid solution. So let's define the low spin fraction. And the volume of an ideal solid solution is, uh, is proportional to the mole fraction of high spin ferropericlase and low spin ferropericlase. This is typical ideal solid solution. Uh, and this, this, this model is based on the fact that there isn't much interaction between high spin iron and low spin iron. because And, uh, and here is the free energy. Uh, also interpolated between the end members, but now we have the mixing free energy, which is the standard for an ideal solid solution. The free energy of, of the end members, high spin, low spin, can be calculated uh, this way, is the free energy plus PV, uh, which is different for the end members. And the free energy <coughs> and, the, and the, the Helmholtz free energy is the static plus vibration of free, free energy of the end members. But there is also another contribution here, which comes from entropy. It's an entropic contribution coming from electrons because we have spins associated with the high spin state and there are multiple possibilities for this spin state. Uh, uh, 2s plus, of, if s is equal to, there are 2s plus 1 possible states, in addition to the fact that the minority electron, the spin down electron, could enter in one of the three T2G orbitals. So this corresponds to different electronic um, configurations. 
So the, this electronic entropy here, uh, uh, this is an entropic contribution. And then there is um, uh, this uh, G mix is the is minus T S, where S is the ideal entropy of the entropy of the ideal solid solution. So the free energy essentially depends on N, and of course um, the free, the free energy of the solid solution depends on N and the free energy of the N members, which we can calculate. So minimizing this G with respect to N, we get a very neat analytical expression for the free energy of the solid, uh, the equilibrium uh, uh, N, low spin fraction for the solid solution. M in this formula is three, is the, uh, is the uh, de degeneracy of the spin down electron, the uh, 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 three T2G states. S is equal to two for the high spin state and zero for the low spin state, of course. And delta G is the difference between static plus vibrational energy of high spin and low spin uh, uh, N members. X is the um, uh, concentration of iron in the, in the solid solution. Um, so the free energy, the Helmholtz free energy, the thermodynamics of the N members, separate N members, is calculated using the quasi-harmonic approximation. We calculate the vibrational spectrum of the N members, and, uh, and which are solid solutions and require some further uh, uh, explanation here. But uh, if we have the free energy of the N member, the Helmholtz free energy of the N members, we have the pressure, the entropy, and the Gibbs free energy of the N members. And uh, at that point in 2006, this is not how we do it anymore, but for ferropericlase at that point, we developed uh, a, a, a vibrational virtual crystal model to calculate the vibrational uh, free energy of the N members. Um, uh, so as you know, virtual crystal, what it means, you know, the mass of the uh, average cation is, the, is a weighted average of the uh, mass of the um, of magnesium and iron and um, and here it, there was something else as well so um, it's mgo in which m magnesium is replaced by an average cation uh, with mass between magnesium and iron also the elastic coefficients between uh, the elastic constants between iron and oxygen uh, uh, the average cation and oxygen has to be well modeled, and uh, we we studied the, the the vibrational spectrum, elastic coefficients by, uh, extracted from the vibrational spectrum of the real solid solutions to model these elastic coefficients between the average cation and oxygen. Anyhow, uh, you can see here that there is difference in average in the vibrational virtual crystal density states for high spin ferropericlase, low spin ferropericlase, and they differ from that of MGO. And this difference in vibrational spectrum uh, 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 affects the, the phase diagram of this phase transition. Of course, if you're studying a high temperature phase diagram, you cannot forget vibrations. And that's why we, uh, we, we had to do something about studying uh, vibrational properties of this strongly correlated solid solution about at that time. It was very early. So uh, what happens um, when at high temperatures? First of all, um, uh, red is the compression curve at 300 Kelvin. And as you can see here, it's our prediction. Uh, uh, there is the high spin state, and then there is an, uh, 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 this, the, the ferropericlase becomes more compressive the compressibility increases in the spin crossover region, and then it, it will enter in the low spin region. It happens that um, uh, in the uh, 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 as you increase the temperature, this crossover increases um, the, the pressure range and moves to higher pressures. This is what happens here. Um, so because the compressibility increases, the book modulus decreases. And this is what you see. I, I think I should have showed something. I should have showed this phase diagram before. Let me, uh, let, I am very sorry. Uh, let me 
jump here and uh, and then I'll, I'll show you again those slides. So this is N, the low spin fraction as a function of pressure and temperature. Uh, uh, this black line is the middle of the transition when we include vibrations in the free energy calculation. And the white line is when we don't include vibrations. This is the effect of electronic entropy, essentially. And uh, so the middle of the transition shifts to higher pressures and then the, the crossover pressure range increases. And this, um, uh, this is experiment. Um, it's slightly different uh, from what uh, we observed, but nevertheless, um, the, the pressure range of the crossover increases with temperature and they have to stop at 2000 Kelvin. I think we still needed to investigate a little further. Um, uh, the the uh, experimentalists also needed to investigate a little further uh, their predictions. I know that at 300 Kelvin, our predictions agree quite well today. Um, but let me show, go back here and show you what, what, what this means for the compression curves. So this is what I mean. The compression curve, the pressure range of the transition increases and the center of the transition moves to higher pressures. This is what happens in the compression curve. And this is what happens for the book modulus. Uh, the book modulus softens when the compressibility increases and with increasing temperatures, the, the pressure range increases uh, and moves to higher pressures. Um, so this has incredible um, consequences, as you can imagine, for um, seismic velocities. And this is something that everybody tried to understand very early. Also, if you are, um, for the implications for thermodynamic uh, uh, properties are, um, are, are, are very important. This is thermal expansion coefficient. The red is uh, zero GPA when everything is high spin. And the quasi-harmonic approximation here uh, overestimates a little bit beyond the, the inflection point. But um, it agrees quite well with experiments when the QAJ is valid. Uh, at 30 GPA, we are still in the high spin state. The thermal, dynamic, uh, the thermal expansion is, is expansivity is normal. But at 50 GPA, we are we start in the high, low spin uh, phase, let me show you here, at 50 GPA, we start in the low spin region, and then by increasing temperature, we move into, we start exciting spins, uh, move into the mixed spin region, and then move into the high spin. The consequences is this. When you excite spins, the, the iron octahedra expands, and you have this absolutely anomalous thermal expansion coefficient. And this anomaly, is uh, moves to higher pressures and broadens uh, later. Uh, there are uh, this type of anomaly exists in all thermodynamics properties, but um, this is very important to see what is happening with the book modulus at different pressures as a function of temperature. At 50 GPA, the book modulus decreases with increasing temperature as we go into the mixed spin region, and then you increase the temperature and the book modulus increases. This is something very unusual. Uh, usually you, you, you increase the temperature, the elastic coefficients decrease and the book modulus decrease, the shear modulus decreases. But here, the book modulus increases, which is very unexpected and has important consequences for seismology. So this is the phase diagram. And uh, this is today. We are still not, um, to agree with experimental data at 300 Kelvin, there is a um, DFT plus U is not perfect. Everybody knows that. Um, we shifted a little bit the difference in uh, uh, energy between the high spin and low spin states at uh, the static free en energy by um, 60 millV per iron to be able to agree and model further. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the velocity, the properties of the mantle. Let me see what time is it. Oh, 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 it's okay. Uh, uh, okay, so let me move faster here. <laughs> it's almost done, right? I have to stop soon. 
Uh, just one minute, Renata. One minute. Oh yeah. my gosh. Okay, but still so plus um, one. I going to explain that there were you know very controversial measurements of elastic anomalies in in this in this in this material um three different measurements published in science and they were all controversial nobody agreed with everybody real one uh, in elastic x-ray scattering so we solved the the problem <laughs> and we uh, Essentially, uh, today we have good agreement with the brilliant scattering. We showed that there is an, a strong anomaly in the book modulus. This is 300 Kelvin. We agree very well with brilliant scattering, and there is not significant anomaly in the shear modulus. So, if we use this property, there, okay, bottom line, ferropericlase, a perovskite doesn't have this type of a anomaly because iron does not. Ferrous iron does not undergo a spin crossover and ferric iron does not undergo a spin crossover because of aluminum. And I'm not going to go through that. Let me um, summarize the, the situation for you. This is the lower mantle, ferropericle, uh, perovskite, ferropericlase. This phase here, we also studied, it uh, does not have iron and there is no implication. But this, the fact that the book modulus in ferropericlase increases with temperature in the middle of the lower mantle uh, conditions, uh, thus the following. Uh, the shear modulus decreases with temperature, the book modulus increases with temperature, uh, um, and uh, the, 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 the compression of velocity becomes insensitive to temperature changes. And the shear modulus has normal behavior. Uh, it, 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 the shear modulus decreases with increasing temperature. In the aggregate of the lower mantle, this issue already it still exists. And the consequence is if you are in the lower mantle and there is a hot anomaly, a plume coming from the core mantle boundary, this is how it manifests in the shear velocity tomography. But because the compression of velocity becomes um, insensitive to temperature in this pressure temperature range between 1500 kilometers depth and 200 and 2000 kilometers depth, the, 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 the compression of velocity map uh, tomography becomes insensitive, and this is how the type of effect that the spin crossover would have in the in compression of velocity map. Um, plumes come from in core mantle boundary. They come to the surface in places like Hawaii. These are called hot spots or intraplate volcanism, and there are many hot spots in the Earth. This is a global tomography P wave model of sixty uh, uh, hot spots in the Earth, and you can see tomography maps like this that have this anomaly in the compression of velocity exactly in the pressure range that we studied. Uh, that P wave becomes insensitive to uh, lateral temperature variations. As if this plume comes from the core mantle boundary is less visible in this uh, depth range that we, we saw. This was interpreted as a barrier to convection in the Earth. So this interpretation that we have based on, on spin crossovers is extremely important to understand convection in the Earth. And there are several also hot other hot spots in the Earth. There are other studies of hot spots in the Earth that say that you can see 10 continuous plumes in S tomographic models, but not a single one in P tomographic models. And this is the example of plumes seen today in S tomographic models. Um, P, uh, P models also show interruption, uh, uh, disruption in convection in cold plates sinking in the mantle in the same uh, depth range. So this, this pin crossover these studies are providing a new interpretation of seismic tomography that explains convection in the Earth, uh, explains seismic tomography, new views on, on, on the interpretation of seismic tomography in the Earth. And uh, today, uh, we still have some challenges on harmonic effects that we have made much, made much progress in understanding and search for new phases of iron, uh, with high iron content, we are also addressing that issue. There are regions in the deep mantle which uh, have high iron concentration, and we need to understand a little bit more multi-phase uh, thermochemical equilibrium. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for being so slow in the beginning. Um, um, oh, okay, I'm uh, open for questions now. And of course, these are 
a team of terrific postdocs and students that I've had and collaborators that helped me to address all these issues. Thank you very much.